Hey y'all, I'm Allie Spears, and this is Ag Chicks, where we dig deep with the women who are helping to feed the world. So today I'm sitting down with Jessica Ogden, and I'm super pumped to talk to another Cowgirl 30 Under 30 honoree um, and get to know a little bit more about you, Jessica, and our listeners to also get to um, understand what you do in the industry and get to know um, kind of what makes you tick and all those kinds of things. So without further ado, Jessica, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me and congratulations to you that this is such a cool uh, community that we're building with Calgary 30 under 30 and the sponsors that made this happen in Calgary magazine. I'm just continually so impressed and just amazed by all the women that we're surrounded with. Um, so my name is Jessica Ogden. I live in Burleson, which is about 30 minutes south of Fort Worth, and I am the content developer at Justin Boots. So that's uh, or Justin Brands. So it's Justin Boots. We've got Tony Lama, Nakona, and then Chippewa as well. Yeah such a cool job. I'm like so mm -hmm. jealous. I feel like you have like the coolest job ever. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about kind of growing up and like your background a little bit maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I grew up in kind of all over DFW area. I did um, elementary school in Cedar Hill, then moved up to Frisco. I went to high school in Allen. So the big, the big football stadium did not grow up in a Western family. My older brother, he rode bulls for us for a while. And then the army found out that he was riding bulls and they did not like that. Um, so he doesn't do that anymore. Dang it. And, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I always loved horses. I definitely got the horse bug. Not sure who I got it from, but I had an imaginary horse in my backyard. Uh, she was black. Her name was legacy. And I would go outside every day and brush her and canter around in circles. And like, we had the wrought iron fence. So the neighbors definitely were like, Oh yeah, that's the weird horse girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was determined and had lots of briar horses, read everything I could about horses, like all of, um, like Charmaine James, those books by uh -huh. Western horsemen and all that. And then, um, in middle school, I convinced my mom to do one lesson a week. And then that became two lessons a week. And then that became leasing a horse and then buying a horse. Uh, and that was uh, my mare Ladybug, who I've now had for 14 years. So she's oh, still wow. around and a um, big part of my story. Yeah. Awesome. And that's so funny because I literally just had a conversation with someone about how everybody seems to go back to like a horse or a, a heifer or whatever it may mm -hmm. be. Um, and it's so funny how they have impacted where we are at today. I was going to say the willow one that you have, the yes. little birthday thing. So cute. <laughs> yes. Yes. Willow. Oh my gosh. She's yeah. a hot mess. Queen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's ladybug for me. I mean, we had her for gosh, a year and a half before I, we were high school rodeo and did barrels on her super talented. Um, she was actually originally a futurity prospect okay. and um, she is the fastest horse I've ever swung a logo over. She's very smart. And then she came up lame on my way to go to a Martha Josie clinic. And oh. um, so I pulled out of that and she ended up having a torn suspensory, minor navicular syndrome, and then cracked sesamoid bones all in her front right foot. Oh my God. And so, yeah. And um, she was a big part of like raising me and making me the, the horse woman I am today. And so um, my mom was very supportive and she helped me make it happen with getting another horse for high school rodeo. That was my horse, Lacey. And Ladybug stayed around and she was just kind of expensive yard art. And uh, I wouldn't really <laughs> change have anything. A few of those. <laughs> yeah. And I, I bred her twice, sold the second one, but I still have her first baby who's um, my ride now, uh, Waffle. And so we're working on cow horse stuff, maybe some breakaway with her. So it's been kind of cool having that full circle of like, she you know, it was a huge part of raising me and then couldn't really ride her and really yeah. learning the side of horsemanship that's not focused on riding. You, you think horses, you're like, oh yeah, you ride them. Yeah. But because of her injury, a lot of my time as a horse owner has not been on the back of a horse. It's been vet bills and um, caring for them in the pasture and all of that. And it's really made me appreciate the in-between stuff that mm -hmm. it's kind of easy to take for granted. Um, and then now that I have the four-year-old, uh, I'm loving every minute of being back in the saddle and uh, training her to hopefully compete. So yeah, she's, she's special. <laughs> yes, I know. There's always those special ones that um, even when they're not of maybe um, use in terms of like writing and that kind of thing, they're mm -hmm. always still tugging at the heartstrings for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. And all the money. She and gets all it money. all. Oh gosh, yes, I know. <laughs> Much to my husband's chagrin. <laughs> I know. And my dad always jokes that he wishes I would have shown goldfish or something like oh, yeah. that. It would have been a lot cheaper. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also important that you mention the aspect that I think doesn't get talked about a lot is the behind the scenes of not being in the saddle but like there's so much else that goes into these um things and so I'm glad that you touched on the the other side of it as well Mm -hmm. yeah and it's that's really the where the magic happens I think about like the day-to-day of the humbling and responsibility nature of um if, if it's frozen outside North Texas, we had a bunch of, uh, ice this past winter yeah. and breaking, breaking ice and canceling plans because you can't go into town because you have to be there to break that ice or put the alfalfa out, um, scheduling farrier appointments and all that, you know, those horses come first and that's very humbling. And, um, but it's also really rewarding and I, I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I think it's the, the hard stuff that makes you appreciate the good stuff, right? Mm-hmm, definitely. So, okay. So you, you had ladybug and Mm -hmm. then, um, after high school, did you continue on with like rodeoing and that kind of stuff? Or what was your kind of the the next step? So I was lined up to compete for A&M on the rodeo team. Okay. And, uh, and then that my other horse, Lacey, she had a round of EPM. So that wasn't going to work out. Um, and I thought it was kind of the end of the world. I was like, you know, whenever you're a young horse girl, you think that the only career is, being a trainer or running a boarding facility or competing at that pro level. And I was like, Oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? Uh, I thought I was going to be a vet. So I went into A&M thinking I was going to be on the rodeo team, go to vet school, um, quickly found out that, um, my studies were not up to vet standards in biology and chemistry and, um, statistics and all that. And, um, I luckily my freshman year, I had an internship lined up at the four sixes and then one, at a youth camp, Lone Hollow in, um, it's outside of Kerrville. Mm-hmm. And I was going to be a Wrangler and I was thinking through it. And I was like, well, four sixes is like the bigger opportunity on paper. I can learn more about horses, but if I go to summer camp, like this is going to be a fun job. I'm a freshman in college. Let's go the fun route. Oh yeah. Uh, went to it, fell in love, changed my major, uh, to youth development and totally changed the trajectory of my life of just like, wow, seeing a little kid, learn confidence and responsibility, um, and integrity while riding a horse. Mm -hmm. It it was just like, Oh man. And if I talk too much about it, I'll start crying. Um, yeah, but I was just like, yeah, this is, this is where I'm meant to be. Um, and so that, you know, it really, it really worked out. And so throughout undergrad, I taught horseback riding lessons and that was a fun way to, cause I still had the two horses at the time, but I could ride them very leisurely, nothing intense. Um, but it was still really caring for them going out, cleaning their stalls and everything. But I got to kind of live vicariously through these, uh, preteen girls that I was taking to local play days and teaching them how to run barrels and how it's not just about going fast, it's being a really good horsewoman and being good to your horse and honoring that and excelling, you know, 1% every day, getting a little bit better. And that was, that was really rewarding. So going into college, it was not the, the horse career that I expected, but I, again, I wouldn't change it. Like God definitely had a plan there and, you know, I I loved it. (laughs) Yeah. You just said a couple of things that personally resonate. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to come back to them. So the first thing about, you know, going in with a one plan and going the opposite (laughs) route, I can definitely, um, agree with that, especially at A&M because I don't know, it has a weird way of making you rethink everything. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that's super important, especially for women in our industry to hear and understand that, um, you don't have to be a vet. Like there's, there's ways to be involved and have really fulfilling careers and connections in this industry without going, you know, the, the textbook plan. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm really glad you touched on that. And for you, was that like a moment when you realized like, Oh my God, I'm not gonna be a vet. Was it like disheartening or how did that kind of play out? I would say at first, I definitely felt like I was failing or giving up on something. Mm -hmm. Um, especially like, um, yeah, I mean, I, I thought that I come from a really smart family. We're all achievers and, um, just kind of go getters. And I was like, Oh man, is it, is this stepping back, um, per se from like this very professional level to be like basically a professional camp counselor. Cause that's what I was like. I want to teach kids how to ride horses yeah. and, um, have this like halfway home for kids and horses. 
And I was like, wait a second, I can impact a lot of people this way. And they can grow on, go on to be either horseback riders or trainers or vets and kind of live that story that I thought I was meant to live. Um, and then, yeah, once I realized that and I had the confidence there, I was like, okay, this is totally my thing. And it was very affirming of like, no, I found it. Like, I'm really lucky to have found it this young, you know? Right. Yeah, Mm -hmm. no. And I think that's another great point is when you do figure out like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I think it's such like a empowering thing for yourself to, first of all, Mm -hmm. be able to acknowledge it when it isn't a part of your initial plan. And then also like lean into that. So I commend you for for going that route, changing the major, doing all those things. And it sounds like it was easy, but it was not. No, it's not. Yeah. I was scared. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, it, especially at that kind of like pivotal point in your life of, I need to make some decisions here that are going to impact me. Um, that's not easy. So Mm -mm. congrats to doing it and what you had a passion for. (laughs) Well, the funny thing is even like since then, my career has totally changed in a different right. direction. It's still like pivotal to like what I want to do in the future, mm-hmm. but my career route has changed um, and shifted to marketing. So it's, you know, that was another one of those things of an opportunity presented itself and I went all in and I was like, okay, I can figure this out. I love horses and whatever you do in the role, if you love horses, you'll figure it out, you know, because yeah. that authenticity will come out. Yeah, for sure. And also your kind of connection when you were working at the summer camp, like obviously maybe not thinking things would connect, but finding that connection of, oh, this is something, completely, oh my goodness, my phone, <laughs> this is something completely unrelated, but yet there can still be that connection. Like that's super powerful too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just very affirming and just, you know, the horse industry, you think it's huge, but it is tiny and so interwoven and connected. Um, so yeah, everything is overlaps in its own beautiful way. Yes, for sure. So then jumping forward to mm-hmm. the present, how mm-hmm. did you get involved with Justin and like kind of find your current role and position? Yeah. So, um, after college, again, I thought that the whole dream was to be really horses was being a trainer or running a big boarding barn and quickly found that people don't want to hire a 22 year old fresh out of college to manage the lives of 80 horses. Imagine that. Um, and so really happening and I just kept looking and looking and, um, kind of getting a little disheartened. I, I was lucky to have that summer job. So I went out there, uh, for the summer. And then I was like, you know, I think I'm going to have to work a desk job, a desk job. And so, um, I was like, Oh, I can't sit still and do the same thing every day. So I was like, okay, let's explore startups because you have to wear lots of different hats. It's always changing. You kind of, um, some days are hard, like less stuff to do. Some days are a lot. And so I was like, okay, well, there's a lot of startups in Austin. And so I started looking at Austin and then I found, a biomedical device for horses. And essentially it's a a smart halter. So there's technology in the crown piece that learns their normal biometrics behaviors. And when they move away from their normal, it'll alert an owner. So that could be foaling, could be colic, some other type of injury, their cast. And yeah, I was like, what? I mean, I almost lost my mare ladybug to colic a few times. And I was like, wow, the industry needs this. So I reached out thought it was like this giant agency because the marketing was beautiful. Um, and the CEO, he's a genius and he really understands branding. And so I reached out to him and I was like, I would love to learn more. I don't know anything about biomedical science engineering, um, but I love horses and I get the impact colic has. And he was like, okay, that's interesting. Let's get coffee. And so we got coffee in downtown Austin and we talked for an hour or so just about my background and kind of what I want to do. And he was like, okay, you're not like a total random crazy person. Let's stay in touch. And basically I worked as a nanny and banged on his door about once a month until he was ready to hire me because it, you know, startup and it was just him at the time. Uh, and he had outsourced some engineering. So it was just him on the full-time side. And, uh, he put me on some case study calls where we kind of hear from owners what they were developing their marketing. Mm -hmm. And then he sent me out to an Arabian horse show, which again was like a totally new thing for me with the Western background. And that uh, January I started full-time as um, I was the man customer service associate, I think. And uh, at the time we were doing pre-orders because the product wasn't available. So it was a lot of going to shows, answering questions, that sort of deal. And then, um, small team. And so we were outsourcing photography, we were outsourcing social media, email marketing, graphic design. 
And I was like, I can figure that out. And so I watched YouTube, went to YouTube yep. University, as they say, and kind of learned all that stuff and tried to take it off of the bill that we were spending so that we right. could invest in, you know, better technology and all that. And so then it kind of evolved into a marketing coordinator role. And then from there, we had a lot of partnerships and sponsorships and different shows and associations. And um, then it evolved into, I was their director of marketing and I was there for ended up uh, five years and it was the best first experience. I mean, like I think any horse girl straight out of college would be so blessed to be able to work for Jeffrey Schaub. I mean, he he let me, he challenged me, he pushed me, um, and he really encouraged me to learn more and more. And he never was like, no, that's not something you should do. He was like, try it. And if it fails, like, okay, we learned. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I was so, so fortunate to have that door opened and that opened my eyes to marketing. And I, I always loved movies, books, um, music videos. It's kind of weird, but there's always yeah. a story in there. Yeah, for sure. And um, so I was like, I mean, I was obsessed with Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia as a kid, like obsessed. And, um, and so I was like, you know, marketing is really, you're, you're telling stories and um, trying to convert people to buy. And so I really started to fall in love with that and just reading every book I could. And at the time we were going to a bunch of um, hunter jumper shows, sport horse shows. So um, hunter jumper, dressage, eventing. And then we did some saddle bread and some Arabian shows. And I was like, wow, this is a massive industry that yeah. as a Western girl growing up, I chose Western because I was super tomboy and I did not want to wear tight pants. I didn't want to wear breeches and I wanted to go fast. So my mom said, okay, barrels. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's how I got into it and obviously loved it. But I had always had this perception and I, I look back on it and I, I just had this bad taste in my mouth that I even thought that of like, oh, that's them. They are, they are different from us. They think that they're better or whatever. Um, and I never really invested in learning from English writers or trying to have relationships and being able to work that job at Nightwatch. I was like, wow. I mean, they're just like us. They dress yeah. differently. They have a different way of doing certain things, but in the end, they are all horse girls and horse boys. Like they love their animals. And some of the animals are just so impressive. Like, I don't know if you've ever been to a Grand Prix where they yeah. jump a meter and like they fly basically over your head. You can feel the ground shaking. I mean, they are impressive yeah. athletes. Yeah. So that was really, really cool. Um, and I loved it and I, um, really wanted to do more Western stuff. And I started to pick up a lot more photography, um, freelance stuff. And then from there I was like, okay, I want to do this full-time, this freelance thing for myself. And it was at the time that I was getting married. So it lined up perfectly, um, with our, our finances at home. And I did that for about a year. And then I saw that Justin had an opening for a content developer. And a, I was like a job at Justin, Holy cow. I've worn yeah. Justin's all my life and right. the rodeo brand. And, yeah. um, you know, I was just iconic. And then I read the job description and I was like, wait, you would be writing stories on the rodeo athletes and, um, the different philanthropies that we're involved in. And you would be developing, um, the concept for a video series and all that. And I was like, wow. <laughs> so, um, reached out, I like, applied on LinkedIn and then, um, basically again, hounded the LinkedIn recruiter until he called me and he did. And then I got the interview and then got the job. And that was in August of last year. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So still fairly new then, I guess yeah. in, mm -hmm. in the world of how we've been living lately. Yeah. Um, but okay. So, so now can you describe, this is probably a very weird question, but like a day and normal day for you, I'm sure it's varies depending on what's going on. Yeah. And that's, what's so funny. Like when I think back of like, Oh, desk job, you're doing the same thing. Every yeah. day. No. And at least not in marketing or Western. I don't, I don't know who does the same thing every day, but it's Definitely not anybody not. I know. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. I mean, it varies. I mean, uh, just now we got out of like an hour and a half meeting, um, with our event marketing director and he's been with us, um, I believe since the eighties and he's awesome and has so much history in the industry and just knowledge of people. And, and our marketing manager for Justin and then our video team. And we were concepting out this short film that we're working on. And so it was just kind of bouncing around a lot of ideas and putting them to paper and thinking through logistics of like, okay, so if we're going to interview so-and-so we need this type of location because that adds to the story and this time of day. Okay. So these are the questions we need to ask them to be able to get the content of that story, the meat of that story. Um, and so that, I mean, that was one, I have a lot of meetings that are just kind of 
we love to brainstorm around here. Um, yeah. We have an open concept office, so nothing is a secret. Everyone works really closely together and that's with product sales and marketing. And so a lot of brainstorming, which I love because um, I think the more minds are in something, the better it is. And we all have our different perspectives and things that we're good at. And we're really lucky here to have a team of just like in crazy, just talented people. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a lot of meetings talking about um, story opportunities, whether that's video, written, or photo, planning photo shoots. Um, a couple weeks ago, we went out to Steamboat and did a kind of last minute photo shoot on an opportunity at this ranch, the Flying Diamond. Fun. And it was three full days of production. We shot over 70 pairs of boots. Um, we had, I want to say around like eight different Wranglers. And then we had a couple local models come in and it was, I mean, it was just boom, boom, boom before sunrise, all the way past sunrise, shooting, swapping boots, cleaning boots, finding cool locations on the ranch, um, played a lot of horse sounds on my phone to get horses to perk their ears, that kind of thing. Um, shielding the sun over the videographer's thing so he could look at his screen. And um, it was both exhausting and like so fulfilling, like empty cup, but also so full cup. Yeah. Just like, okay, I am in my niche. Like we are telling stories about people who love horses and live this life. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, such a cool, the fact that you get to do that on a regular basis. I'm so jealous because yeah. I, I love that stuff, but also how cool and like informative for whoever's mm -hmm. listening that mm -hmm. there's so much more that goes into like you may be scrolling through Instagram and see a picture, but like all the little things that had to line up in order for the lighting to be right, the horse to be looking in the right directions, the detail on the pants or boots or whatever to be in the right yeah. angle. Like there's so much that goes into this. And I think people don't really understand that. Yeah. I mean, when I think about like the footwear, especially the Western footwear business in general, we are creating content that's going to be seen by people at least six months out, if not more. Right. So essentially we're working on a line of boots now that we would be marketing to a Cavenders, a boot barn, an NRS, a retailer that they would then choose to buy or not buy. And then from there, customers won't see it for another six months or so. So we are constantly thinking seasons ahead and trying to stay ahead of trends um, that are happening now for when this will be marketed. And beyond that, I mean, we are trying to find models and a lot of the times we try to use um we try to do a mix of using actual models that work for agencies and then using real world people because justin is like that real everyday brand i mean it's Very much so. it's for the cowboy mm -hmm. and we really pride ourselves on that authenticity and so we will find people living the lifestyle because they know how to put their foot in a stirrup they know what movement on a horse or next to a cow is going to make sense or not make sense and that is so important because our customer base they know the western industry they live and breathe it um and so they need that authenticity and you know that holds us to a really high standard and our our founder a long time ago he founded it in 1879 and he said that he hoped to leave behind him an institution that would uphold the standards of the west and so that's our that's our whole motto is this is the standard of the west we have to uphold it and that that happened back then it's happening today and it has to keep happening in the future. So we, we have to really plan and make things truly authentic and, um, and inclusive and just, um, really high standards. And that's so important to us. Yeah. And I think because we live in this world of like instant, um, absorption of anything and everything through our stinking phones mm -hmm. it, that's creates a challenge for companies, um, doing what you are currently doing as far as, mm -hmm. like you said, like, you want to be on trend, but you have to predict it because it's going to be a, a timeline much further in, in front of what you're at currently in. So do you guys have like a, I don't want to say secret because I don't want you to give me all your secrets, but like a way to like project that or how does that happen? I think the biggest thing is we just try to really ingrain ourselves in the culture. Yeah. Um, all of us that work here, um, we are going to the local rodeos. We are trying to go to those sale barns, those horse shows. Um, we wear boots wherever we go. We try to have those conversations with ranchers, with farmers, and um, we follow all of the right people on Instagram and on Facebook so that we're constantly learning. We listen to podcasts like yours and we're trying to always be better and hold ourselves accountable to truly learning the lifestyle. It's not just something that I, I can speak for everyone here. Like it's not like a nine to five thing. Like this is a full-time deal. Like whenever you go home, 
you're still thinking about boots. You're thinking about the people that wear them. Um, it's kind of just this constant thing, but uh, I wouldn't change it. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how I operate. And so it's, you know, it's, a, it's a pleasure. And like, we are constantly motivated by our two give backs, the JST, the sports medicine, and then the, the cowboy crisis fund, because mm-hmm. that's in the end, that's what it's all about. Yes. We're selling boots, but we want to help cowboys and further the industry and, and the sport of rodeo. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think that's a unique thing for our industry is the companies that are the well-known ones, obviously like Justin and, and other companies like that. Um, they really are invested in the industry, not only from a standpoint of obviously that's where their, their customers are coming from, but they're interested and invested in the furthering of it and the promotion and the existence and the authenticity. So um, that's something I personally love. And I'm so glad that as in your current role, that's something that you guys are, are really striving to focus on. Yeah. That's like the most important part. You know, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for Cowboys. I mean, this, this whole company was founded by HJ Justin and he, was in Spanish Fort, Texas, right off the Chisholm Trail. And he saw that cowboys were coming in after pushing their cows and their their boots were struggling because it's mm-hmm. a hard, it's a hard life. And so he started fixing them and then it became making them and then making custom ones. And then, you know, it became a generational thing where his sons followed and his daughter followed in his footsteps. Um, and so yeah, this is, you know, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the cowboy. So we have to remember that everything we do is for the cowboy. Yeah, I love that. And so actually on in loot in conjunction with that, but also kind of a little bit on the flip side, how do you think like the role of like the cowgirl also plays into that? And so that is the part that I love the most, obviously. Um, we have some amazing endorses. One of them is Sherry Servi, just a legend in herself. And we try to incorporate those stories really well. And um, our, our president here, he is, uh, his name's Greg, and he really pushed a lot of us to you know, you really ought to apply to 30 under 30. That's a really great program. It's a great magazine. Um, we're always trying to support cowgirl magazine, um, with ads and different partnership opportunities. Um, and that has been really uplifting because the executive team here, they really prioritize, uh, making sure that those females and those roles are really, um, celebrated and, um, that they feel like their job there is really important. Um, right. And then working with those female endorsees like Sherry Servi, Mary Walker, um, it's it's so cool. And one of our brands actually, Nakona, mm-hmm. it's um, John Justin, who a lot of people associate Justin with. And he was uh, the mayor of Fort Worth for a while, very involved with the stock show. Um, his sister, uh, when they initially, him and his brothers moved Justin from Nakona, Texas to Fort Worth because of like the railroads and just the growing metropolis, um, she decided to stay in Nakona and stay true to her small town. And so she opened up a separate boot company, that's Nakona, which okay. is now part of our umbrella. And I mean, in the twenties, this is a woman that was going out on unpaved roads, right. selling to men. She was selling boots wow. to men. And that is so cool because that was counterculture in the twenties. Very um, much so. <laughs> and like she stuck to her guns and she tried to honor her dad and everything that she did and her heritage and where she came from. And so that she's been like a really, her name is Miss Enid, Enid Justin. And so we try to always keep her as like a guiding light for women because she really set the tone of like, you know, a badass woman who yeah. really wanted to further her family's name. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I yeah. love that. And I love that you guys kind of honor that too, as mm-hmm. you um, progress through the new seasons that we're encountering. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Jessica, um, as we're kind of wrapping up here on time, um, I want to thank you for your time and taking time out of your schedule and meetings and all that kind of stuff. I really appreciate it. Um, but kind of in conclusion here, if you were to kind of give advice maybe to your younger self who was dealing with those dilemmas of what do I do? Do I follow my passion? All those kinds of things. What maybe is something you'd share? I would say just owning who you are. Um, I think at the time, like, especially in high school, I was like, yeah, I'm that weird horse girl. Uh, I need to keep that on the DL, keep it undercover. Um, and then now I'm like, yeah, I'm that weird horse girl. Yeah, <laughs> like, I really love right. horses. And Own it. <laughs> yeah, just owning it and and working really hard and staying humble. I think this industry has a way of you have to work hard to get anything done. Um, but the second you get a little too confident, it will it will humble you. And I really appreciate that about the industry and um, horses. They do that a lot regularly, daily. Um, especially a four year old red roan mare who is very sassy. Um, so yeah, I think just work hard, be humble and just stick to your guns. 
Yep. I love that. Well, Jessica, like I said, thank you so much. Congratulations on Cowgirl 30 Under 30. Very much deserved. Um, and I'm excited for the listeners to hear more about you and, and what you do. Um, and if somebody is wanting to connect with you, what is a good way for them to do that? I try to um, give some behind the scenes look at a day in the life at Justin over on my Instagram, which is uh, the road just traveled with underscore. So the underscore road underscore just underscore traveled. Um, and I have a lot of uh, sassy images of my um, four-year-old mayor and the 18-year-old mayor uh, giving me sass on a daily basis. So you'll see a little bit of life of living on a couple acres with horses there too. <laughs> Perfect. And I will include that as always in the description and show notes. Um, and Jessica, thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Ag Chicks. Don't forget to follow along on social media at Ag Chicks on Instagram and Facebook. And that every episode has a visual version on YouTube on the Ag Chicks channel.